Please take a seat, we're about to make a start. And thank you everyone for coming along to this second session after lunch here at PyCon uh, 2014 here in Montreal. Our next presenter uh, has a PhD in developmental biology from Caltech and um, he says he likes Python a lot. He currently works at Michigan State University and today is going to talk about data-intensive biology in the cloud, instrumenting all the things. Please welcome Titus Brown. Right. All right. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, so I wanted to start with a few upfront definitions. Uh, first of all, um, uh, there's a lot of confusion about what big data means. And I'd like to point out, as far as I'm concerned, it means whatever is still inconvenient to compute upon. If you can do the computation easily, it's no longer big data. Uh, data scientist, you may have seen this before. It's a statistician who lives in San Francisco. Um, and a professor was ably defined uh, earlier, on, earlier today by Fernando Perez, someone who writes grants to fund the people who do the work. Um, and so uh, I am a professor and not a data scientist because I live in Michigan. Um, and I write grants so that others can do data-intensive biology. Um, I'd also like to dedicate this talk to Terry Peppers. So uh, Terry is a friend who helps run the uh, testing in Python, Birds of a Feather. He couldn't be here this year. I um, mean, for the last five years, as I've taken on my faculty position, he's, um, he's progressively uh, grown less understanding of what it is that I do. Um, and so every year, it's like, I, d I, didn't under I understood even less of your talk this year than I did last year. So it struck me that um, this, this winter, we were stuck. I, I don't know how many of you live in the north. Uh, the frozen wastes. Um, uh, this year we had a lot of snow in Michigan, and so I spent a lot of time indoors with my six-year-old uh, uh, doing puzzles. And, and it struck me that she was asking the same question that Terry was asking me. And I figured that if I could explain what I do at work to my six-year-old, probably Terry might understand it also. <laughs> so what I do is I actually assemble puzzles for a living. And, and I told this to my six-year-old. We were actually working on a puzzle, and she, she looked at me with a sort of wide-eyed wonder and said, you actually get paid to do that? I said, well, it's a little more complicated. I strategize about solving multidimensional puzzles with billions of pieces and no picture on the box. But it's still solving puzzles. So if, you, if, if I give you many, 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 many pieces of a puzzle and uh, ask you to come up with a strategy, there are sort of three basic strategies that you could use. These are all strategies used in genome assembly, which is what I actually work on. And the three strategies are a greedy strategy, where you say, hey, this piece sort of fits this piece. Let's mash them together. Um, which has some obvious flaws, as my six-year-old has found out. Um, N squared, do these two pieces match? How about these two pieces? How about these two pieces? Um, and then the Dutch approach. And I figure for, the, for PyCon, the Dutch approach is obviously going to be the right one. And so I thought I'd try and explain it this way. So the Dutch approach is also known as De Bruyne assembly. And the idea behind it is that what you do is you, you d decompose each puzzle piece down into small patches. And then you look for similarities among those patches. And, and essentially, these patches that you decompose things into can be easily hashed and compared in a hash table, which actually ends up making, turning everything into a linear problem. And so you're finding these similarities within your puzzle pieces. And algorithmically, it's pretty awesome. It's linear in time with the number of pieces, which is way better than n squared, right? However, it's also linear in memory with the volume of the data, and this is largely due to errors in the digitization process. If you have small errors when you're reading the pieces into the computer memory, those errors will cause problems with the hashing, and you end up having to keep track of all of the different tight little patterns that you have. And so this is basically the problem that we've spent uh, five or six years in my lab trying to solve. Um, just to show you the practical effects of this, for about $500 of, of sequencing data today, we, can, we would require about 100 gigabytes of RAM in order to, to put that puzzle together, to put these sequences together. Um, and so this was a real problem a couple years back. It's still a real problem uh, it, within the field, although we've, prevent, we've provided some, uh, some um, approaches that help deal with it. So our research challenges, uh, the, the research challenges that we tackle in my lab, that it, right now it only costs about $10,000 and, and takes about a week to generate enough sequence that really no commodity computer can handle it, and even really very few supercomputers can handle that amount of sequence in terms of us doing this sort of puzzle piece, putting the sequences back together. 
Um, and the other problem is that hundreds to thousands of such data sets are actually being generated by biologists on a, on a weekly to, to monthly basis. And so this is really a really vast data analysis problem, it's sort of the inverse of the particle accelerator problem where you have one big particle accelerator generating vo massive volumes of data and then thousands of people looking at the data. Here you have many thousands of people generating data that only a few people can analyze. So the nice thing is that over the last five or six years, we've basically solved or at least addressed this top approach. Uh, and what I'm going to tell you about today is some of the outcomes of our attempts to address this bottom issue, which is that we're generating lots of these data sets. So our research, uh, the computer science side of our research, is that we've built a streaming lossy compression approach. And basically what we can do is we can read in each piece one at a time and say, have we seen this piece before or not? And if we have seen the piece before, we can discard it and decrease the total number of pieces we're looking at. Uh, and it turns out to be a single pass algorithm, and it's really nice and low memory and all of that. Um, we've also invested heavily in a lot of probabilistic data structures, low memory probabilistic data structures, which I talked about last year. And we're now to reach a point with our computer science research where our memory now scales considerably better. It scales with the amount of information in the puzzle, which is basically the size of the picture, which is always much smaller than the number of pieces we have. And this I is sample dependent, but typically it's 1 20th or, or less than the number of pieces in the, uh, in the, uh, that we have in front of us. The other research approach, and the other component of our research is um, really uh, was, was addressed very nicely by Fernando this morning. So um, we've invested heavily, uh, coming from the Python community, I've invested heavily in things like open source, open science, open access, reproducible computational research, using tools that are pretty familiar here and are really never heard of in scientific conferences. So we use GitHub, we use automated testing, we use continuous integration, we have a literate testing framework that we've just put in place. We um, blog about our stuff, we tweet about our stuff, and we use IPython Notebook to do all of our data analysis. Essentially, our papers do come, as Fernando says, there's, here's the data, here's the GitHub repository, here's a make file, type make, and here's, your, here's all of your data analyzed just as we did it. Um, and as part of this, we've been uh, extending our efforts into more general protocols. So our papers are on our software, but then we also want to integrate our software into a larger ecosystem of, of stuff that people actually use to do biological sequence analysis. And for, for that purpose, we've actually been developing these protocols um, and uh, applying them to uh, tackle squishy biology problems. So I thought I should put a real biology slide in. These are uh, two organisms that we work on that you find off the coast of France. They look basically like rocks for, for disguise. They're sea squirts. And this is what they look like underneath their tunic. This is actually the gonad, which we then harvest eggs and sperm from. and um, generate embryos, which we then do horrible things to. Um, so uh, um, these protocols are actually directly useful for real biological purposes. And what I'm going to talk about for the rest of, the for the rest of my talk is, is uh, trying to understand how these protocols perform computationally. So the, the trick is, rather than writing a black box pipeline, a set of scripts that you feed data into and that outputs something, um, we've actually written a set of tutorials uh, for running through a data analysis from start to finish in the cloud. So the great thing about the cloud is you, you know what machine you're going to get, you know what resources you have, you can configure it exactly the way you want, and it can be 100% reproducible. And so we've written these tutorials, which you can go find online uh, very easily associated with my blog post. Um, and we've written them in English with a bunch of shell commands. So you have to basically know how to use SSH and, and start up a cloud machine in order to run them. Um, and then, uh, so we've been using them for education. And actually, on Monday, I'll be giving a software carpentry uh, tutorial that's running through some of these. Um, but then we've also said, well, why stop there? Why not do literate testing? So what we've done is we've written a, a, um, a, a very simple shell script that actually runs through all of our protocols, pulls out the shell commands, and then turns them into shell scripts that can be run for several different purposes. One purpose is for a tool competition. So if people want to swap in different tools and run the same workflow with one thing changed, they can do that very easily. We've actually implemented them as acceptance tests on our actual core software, which is integrated into these protocols. And then we've all, we're also using them for benchmarking, and that's what I'll be talking about for the rest. And I think one thing that, that we've been seeing is that when you actually do all of this, when you do these things correctly, you have everything in GitHub, you have everything automatically tested, um, you, it sort of becomes this unstoppable f uh, uh, force for forward momentum in science because um, we don't have to worry about bit rot. Our, 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 our backs are protected because everything that, that we do is sort of automatically um, run on a pretty regular basis, with a few exceptions. Okay. so. This talk was going to be about benchmarking, so let me get to some benchmarking. So our benchmarking strategy was basically to go out and find how our protocols ran on real computers. Um, and by real computers, I mean fake computers that you rent from Amazon or Rackspace. So we went and rented a bunch of cloud VMs. 
We extracted the commands from the tutorials using our literate resting framework and their instructions for running all of this. And then we used this neat package that we'd never, I'd never heard of before, but that several different people found via Google and sent to me, um, called SAR, which is a uh, um, system activity report, I think, part of the sysstat package, to simultaneously sample the CPU, RAM, and disk I.O. that was currently happening. And from that, we get output that looks like this, which is, is, is really quite cool. This is from an IPython notebook in Matplotlib uh, figure. Um, and what you can see here is uh, for a data subset that takes about an hour to run, um, we have the CPU load in blue, we have the RAM uh, load in uh, gigabytes in red, and the disk thousands of transactions per second in green. What you can see for the entire run of our protocol, which goes through quality control and some trimming and filtering and some assembly and some differential expression, there's a lot of different things going on that all have various different CPU requirements, disk requirements, and... Um, sorry, disk requirements and memory requirements. And just keep an eye on the RAM. The whole purpose of our research program for the last six years has been to decrease this red line to the point where we can run it on a larger variety of computers. So each protocol has many steps. Here I've labeled them the quality control, digital normalization, which is our software, assembly, annotation, and differential expression analysis. And we're really most interested in the RAM intensive bits, which is the digital normalization and the assembly. And again, this takes about an hour, and when you run it on the entire protocol, it's about 40 hours. So this is about, uh, this is about how long it takes to run through our protocol for a uh, set of data that cost about, uh, about $8,000 and took about a week to generate on a machine. And what you can see is um, things change when we're using the whole data set. Uh, um, the DigiNorm phrase, which is our software, takes less time, but then the assembly actually takes a lot of time and is very... Um, uh, fairly intensive CPU-wise and uses a lot of memory and somewhat unpredictably, and then actually uses very little disk, um, has very little disk access. So this is, um, this is our complete protocol run on, uh, sorry, this is our, our protocol on, run on the entire data set. Okay, so we have all sorts of numbers like this in our repository. I encourage you to go dig through them if you're interested. What kind of conclusions did we reach? So one observation is that Rackspace offers by default faster machines. So for the 15 gigabyte machine that we were using, um, it took only 34 hours to run through our entire protocol for a cost of about 23 bucks. Um, and then the various Amazon machines were considerably slower, although given the different cost, you can depend whether or not you want to optimize for latency or for cost, right? Doesn't either, you can, you can pick your battle. The second observation, and this one is something that I would love to hear theories on, is that the, the Amazon ephemeral storage is faster than the EBS block devices, even if you turn the IOPS performance all the way up. So what we did was we have three M1.x large machines here. These are 15 gigabytes of RAM, um, and that's basically and a couple hundred gigabytes of, of local ephemeral storage. And when we added uh, either for the data disk or for our working disk, um, the maximum IOPS, IO operations per second onto uh, the data disk or the working disk, we just slowed things down steadily. And I should say, this all costs money. So we're paying more money to get worse performance. And I didn't factor in the disk costs here. This is just the per hour cost. The disk costs on a 24-hour basis are essentially negligible. Um, and the only thing I can think of here, and this is my, my current working hypothesis, is that what you're paying for with the IOPS is better average behavior, um, whereas the ephemeral storage frequently can be better, but they don't guarantee that. They don't guarantee the, the, the worst case scenario can be considerably worse. And I see a few people nodding. Um, I'd love to hear from you afterwards if you actually, if this isn't a guess on your part. <laughs> um, okay, observation number three. Uh, so the NUMA architecture is um, uh, uh, an important aspect of big machines. So I sh I, let, me, let me take a step back. So all of our software writes, uh, all of our software, the KHMR software, um, works with really large hash tables. What we do is we go out and we allocate you say, I want to use 100, megabytes, 100 gigabytes of memory, and I want it split among four hash tables. And these are probabilistic data structures, and we use them in this way. They, they implement a count min sketch, which I talked about last year. And we use them this way because um, it's considerably more memory efficient than any possible uh, exact data structure, but you do have to specify how much memory you're going to be using up front. When you have these big hash tables that you're indexing into randomly, you run into something called the non-uniform memory access architecture. On multi-core, on multi-CPU machines, there are different parts of the memory that have preferential access to each, for, for each of the uh, CPUs. And so if you're, on this CP, if you're computing on this CPU and reaching over to this memory, it will be a lot slower potentially than if you're reaching to sort of memory that's local to that uh, CPU. And so here um, we're showing the effects of the slowdown. What, what I did was uh, the slowdown due to the sort of 
long-range memory access. And so what we did was we took uh, a constant task, a very small task that took about a minute on, um, with small amounts of memory. And we did the same task over and over and over again with d increasing amounts of total memory used, all the way up to a terabyte of memory. We do have data sets where we need to use a terabyte of memory. So this is all run on our HPC, because right now I don't know of any cloud computing machines that offer a full terabyte of memory, nor did I want to pay for them. So um, the, uh, the total time here is in solid blue. And it basically, you can see that you go from something that takes a minute or two to something that takes almost an hour when you go up to a terabyte of memory. Now, the, this blue line could be caused by the fact that you're allocating a terabyte of memory and you need to zero it out. Maybe the allocation phase is really slow. So I separately benchmarked the post-allocation phase. And what you can see is computing on the same data on the same machine, but uh, in slightly, in considerably larger memory, you get a really significant slowdown just from the fact that you're accessing so much memory. And if you compute the ratio, this is the lost time ratio due only to the RAM access, you can see that um, you get a 20 to 25-fold slowdown for, for uh, increasing the amount of memory you're using by, by, by such a great, great amount. So that was, uh, that was quite a surprise, actually, the effect. We knew from running it that, that this was a problem, but from watching it while it ran that this was a problem, but we never really benchmarked it to this extent. So the next question is, why can't we just use a faster computer? Why don't we just rent a faster computer? So it turns out Amazon now offers an M3.extra large, and M3.extra large is a computer that has uh, two 40 gigabyte SSD drives, and it's about 40% faster cores. And what we see when we run our demo data is that the SSD drives and it's about 40 percent faster cores and what we see when we run our demo data is that we get about a 30 percent sp uh, speed boost. It goes from about 3,000 seconds to about 2,000 seconds. So we thought we'd try it out on the whole data set. And here's the fun bit about data intensive computing. Um, turns out that we ran out of disk space because 40 gigabyte hard drives, 80 gigabyte hard drives in this case, actually we ran it on a 2x large, um, 80 gigabyte hard drives weren't big enough for our full data set. So we'd have had to complicate our engineering in order to, to spread the data over multiple hard drives. In fact, I'm not sure 160 gigs would have been enough either. So at the moment, with a lot of the cloud computing platforms, you can have fast disk or lots of disk, but you can't have both on the same computer. Um, or you end up becoming really expensive. What, those are your options. And so it's an interesting lesson that, you know, you, you really have to pick what you're going to optimize for. Are you going to optimize for latency, or do you care about cost, or do you, what else, what, other, what are the other things you care about? Um, okay, so, so for the data-oriented portion of the talk, the future directions, I think, um, I'm going to reprioritize investing in cached local data structures and algorithms. Rather than these massive hash tables that are spread all over memory, we're going to try and, I think, I think we should figure out how to work more locally. Um, uh, some of our, our pain is caused by writing the same data out to disk and reading it back in because we can't keep it all in memory. And I think that we have, um, some, algor we have some algorithms in mind for turning everything into a purely streaming approach, which may cost more memory, but might actually be considerably faster. And then the somewhat surprising conclusion to me, I mean, I guess I was already leaning in this direction, but it's nice to have some numbers. I'm worried that I don't know that straight code optimization or infrastructure engineering is an, in, in, a worthwhile investment for us. That would complicate the protocols. It would complicate what we're actually doing. And it's not clear that it's going to give us more than a 50% speed increase compared to what like cache, optimize, cache local data structures and algorithms would give us, just like a 30 or 40 fold increase in speed. OK, so I give a lot of talks. Apparently, when I speak, I'm somewhat approachable, which is something I'm working on. Um, and um, so people come up and offer solutions. So here are a couple frequently offered solutions. So um, you should like totally multi-thread that. Um, and so we did this. Uh, um, we, we wrote a chapter uh, um, for in the performance of open source applications. And we can actually get a two or four-fold speed up before we become really solidly I.O. bound. Um, and it turns out that the code that results from this is, is, is kind of a mess and is a current maintenance headache. And so it's not clear it was a great investment, actually. Um, Hadoop will just crush that workload, dude. I hear this a lot. Uh, it's unlikely to be cost effective. We have, I'll talk about this in a little bit, but we have a lot of data. We have no locality in the data. We can't shard the data easily. Um, and our individual compute per unit of data is essentially trivial. And so, um, the cost of distributing it, of fanning it out and fanning it back in and, and gathering it back in is likely to, to really over-dominate um, the cost of everything, the time. And then um, uh, I think Fernando talked about this also. Uh, have you tried, quote, my proprietary big data technology stack? You got to Silicon Valley and a bunch of people are like, hey, I have a company that, that, that can solve all your problems. I can't give you the source code, but it's going to be awesome when you run it. And the problem is that if you're actually trying to do science, having hidden methods that may have unknown effects doesn't, that can't possibly work. Um, or, well, it does for a lot of people, but I don't think it's good science. So, 
Okay, so um, here's the ranty portion of my talk. Optimization versus scaling. So everybody wants to suggest linear time memory improvements, and we actually spent two years eking out a 20-fold improvement during which we got a 100-fold increase in data generation per, um, uh, per unit dollar, um, which meant that we were falling slightly slower behind than everybody else, which is not a winning strategy. The puzzle problem is a graph problem. It's got big data, it's got no locality, and it's got small compute. It's simply not a friendly computational problem for today's architectures. And what we really needed to do was scale our algorithms, or rather the algorithms that were being used in the entire field. And we've gotten now down to the point where machines, things that previously needed to run on really expensive, you know, um, uh, 16 terabyte memory machines can now run on single chassis computers and about 15 gigabytes of memory. Um, because we chose to uh, f stop doing, th doing the uh, linear time memory improvements and go for, for algorithm scaling. It did take five years, but you know, I'm an academic, that's okay. So um, uh, optimization versus scaling, I think many people forget when they see something like this and they say, well, I'm going to choose the black line because the red line is clearly inferior in terms of compute resources needed. They forget that if you zoom out and you tackle a big enough problem that scaling is eventually going to dominate. And this can be a better investment of your time if your data size is growing. It's a totally made up graph, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> um, and I actually see at PyCon and online and blogging and so on that a lot of people are focusing on pleasantly parallel problems, anything that you can shove into Hadoop, basically. And I worry about a couple things. One is that Hadoop's fundamentally not that interesting. Um, another is that if you're actually doing research on this stuff, it's about a hundredfold improvement, not about a can we buy more machines and throw, throw things at the machines. Ultimately, depending on how your data input scaling, you're going to run into problems with that approach. Um, and I think research can really, uh, there's a lot of, CS research gets a lot of bad press because um, we look like we're not doing anything, and maybe sometimes that's true, but we're also working on things like scaling new problems and evaluating, creating new data structures and algorithms. And I think um, we perform a, a valuable, a useful service sometimes. Um, this is a talk from my PyCon 20, a slide from my PyCon 2011 talk. So I, I, I'd like to make a pitch to all of you, which is life's too short to tackle the easy problems. You should come work for me for a lot less money instead. Um, uh, or academia more generally. Here we have problems that are really hard to parallelize and for which we have no money whatsoever. It's way better than going to Google and working on Google search, which is relatively easy. So, um, you know, come talk to me. I, I was going to say, um, you know, Alex Gaynor at some point is going to realize that his life's not that challenging and then he's going to come work for me for pennies and it's going to be awesome. Okay. So um, I think I'll conclude there. Uh, uh, Lee Sheneman uh, is a graduate student who started the benchmarking project. I, um, uh, and then a bunch of labbies contributed to this, Mike Crusoe, Louise Erber, Lakit, Camille, and QP. Um, all of our stuff is freely available under BSD licenses. I have a blog post uh, with resources and pointers to everything. I should point out um, Michael, Lakit, Camille, and QP are here at PyCon. Um, you can probably afford to buy them from me. Um, uh, I didn't put their pictures up because I want to make it a little bit more challenging for you to find them. Um, the reason I say this is actually that <laughs> Camille's right over there. Um, uh, I, the reason I say this is I've now, uh, I, I, I had one graduate student get his PhD and go to Amazon six months before he defended, and another graduate student got bought by Google, uh, sorry, got offered a job by Google um, uh, about three, two years before his defense, and he was like, hey, they just offered me triple your salary, what do you say? I'm like, well, you should go. Um, so. Uh, um, but it is a little frustrating to keep on losing people, but they're awesome people and you should hire them, so please uh, go ahead. I'll cheer for them while crying. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. So, if you have anything to say, uh, come and line up at this uh, microphone here in the middle of the room. Uh, we're taking questions for Titus and job offers for Titus's uh, students. <laughs> yes. Hi, Titus. As always, in wonderful stuff you're working on. Thank you. Um, I, I think the answer to the question in advance is you don't know, but I, I, I know I've talked to you, but I work in a, another, in a science lab in a different domain that's not really related in molecular dynamics. And um, this lab has built very custom hardware and as a consequence got two to three orders of magnitude improvement over the next best supercomputers in the world for this problem set and no good for anything else. We do have like things like um, 
memory locality in the partitioning of the space, although you know, um, latency requirements in a node is very crucial. So it's, it's, it's a very different sort of um, mm -hmm. parallelism issues than you have. But if you had a lot more money than you have, <laughs> millions and millions to actually design hardware, is this something that custom hardware could make you know, two yeah. or three orders of magnitude faster, not 20% faster? Sure. So custom hardware. So how, um, of course. <laughs> yeah, so, so there is a company called, I think, Convey that, that is doing this. Um, and the, the fundamental problem here, I mean, apart from the fact that if somebody gave me billions of dollars, I would invest it in people rather than hardware, but, um, or a vacation. But the, um, the, the fundamental problem here is that the data generation capacity has been so democratized that there are thousands, if not tens of thousands of labs generating this data. And so that custom hardware would have to be bought by all of them. And typically, they generate the data or provided centrally. And, and the, the field of, there's a cultural problem. The field of biology just doesn't like to play nice that way. And, and there's a, another problem, which is that um, the downstream applications change. The applications change fast enough that I worry about the lack of flexibility. So I'd be interested in looking into like FPGA-style solutions where you can reconfigure exactly how you're doing it. But I worry that, that the, the, the time cost of investing in hardware generation would be too long on the scale, at the, at the speed with which the field is moving. I, I don't know, just an intuition. But you know what, give me a million as a pilot project and, and we'll see. <laughs> then I can keep some of my grad students. Hi Titus, great talk. Thank you. Uh, maybe it's different in biology, but in my own academic experience in computer science, software engineering, Unfortunately, the funding agencies and the journals tended not to care about this incredibly interesting, awesome, very difficult work necessary to build the tools and techniques to do the no, quote unquote real research. Same stuff. field. Same field. Are you seeing any changes in, in how, I've, yeah. I've been out of academia for a couple of years now, but are you seeing any changes in how yeah, funding so, agencies and journals look at this kind of work versus the yeah. pure stuff? So there's a great post by Jake Vanderplas on the big data brain drain. And the problem is that anybody that knows how to effectively develop software and has any intelligence whatsoever flees academia for industry as quickly as possible. So they're getting paid a lot more, and they're doing work that's appreciated. And in academia, especially in biology, we have this problem that we don't have, any senior, we don't have many senior people that are really focused on software engineering and tool development. And so they're not represented in the grant panels, they're not re represented in the people that decide how the funding's allocated. And uh, it's, just, it's a big problem because there's nobody to speak for that. Um, it's slowly changing in part because myself and some other people are finally getting to the point where um, uh, we're senior enough to talk to the program managers, and the program managers are also seeing that there's a slowdown in biology because all the biolog biologists are generating data that they cannot analyze at all. So it's slowly changing, but it's going to be a generational thing. It's always more exciting to generate new data, even if you can't analyze it, than it is to analyze, than to do the boring job of figuring out how to analyze the data you already have. Um, hi, I'm wondering your specific problem or generic problem in biology, are they amenable to um, crowdsourcing? Or crowdsourcing. Um, I have to think about it. Uh, this one, probably not, but I think we're trying to get to the point where the data we generate, the information we generate from the data will be amenable to human analysis. Right now, this is all fairly boring on the, on the human time scale. We just want to compute. It means something down the road, and, and that's where we should bring in humans. I don't think it's ready for crowdsourcing yet, but I have to think about that. Thank you. Uh, hey, I, I saw that Amazon has like a new HPC kind of network set up, and I haven't been able to take it for a spin, but it's like halfway between commodity and supercomputer, yeah. and I was wondering if you've run your workload on that and, and what that's like. So, so I, get this, I get the kind of question a fair bit. What if you had this kind of HPC? And I guess what I'd say is, um, we're almost entirely RAM limited. So as soon as we have to run across multiple chassis, it's no longer effective. So um, the HPC offerings from, from Amazon and our local HPC at Michigan State all have fast interconnects, but the, chass the individual chassis aren't necessarily that powerful. And so we're trying to do everything on a single chassis with no use of interconnects. So even like InfiniBand or one of these high memory, yeah. it's still too slow? Uh, I, I think it's the latency that's the problem, not yeah. the speed gotcha. with that. 
uh, related to the academic brain drain, I think the reason a lot of people leave, the reason I left, is that the job market is poor, not in the sense that like you get paid less, but that it's hard to find a job at all often. Um, sure. What do you think, like, solutions for that? Do you have any thoughts on the matter? Uh, okay, so... Um, <laughs> L like, will just um, more grant money solve it? Like, it doesn't seem sustainable to me. I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a systemic, it's just a systemic issue. Um, and I mean, more grant money is the, is, the easy, is the easy answer. I think the better solution is to become, I don't know, maybe more, be a little more efficient at how we're using the grant money, allocate it to people who are doing data analysis as well as data generation, and then there would be a need. Right now, yeah, I don't know. It's a very, let's get some beer. <laughs> Everybody, please thank Titus Brown.